tell if it's live. <laughs> All right, we are live. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Meet the Master. I'm here with Master, Master Jeff Setianto. Welcome, sir. Thanks for joining me. Absolutely. How's it going? It's going good. <laughs> As you see, uh, Master S is a little wet. Uh, we're at Legacy Martial Arts. Uh, Master S is doing a Harry Potter wizarding camp this, this week, and uh, the Watson children are uh, huge Harry Potter fans, so they are here. So I figured it'd be a chance to just sit down and uh, talk in the same room, which is not something I've been able, uh, afforded the luxury of doing these interviews lately. Um, so um, just as a full disclosure too, so there will be interruptions during this, uh, during this uh, interview, um, everywhere, everything from uh, kids being kids and uh, also uh, coaches that need to come in to grab things in the office that we're sitting in. And just now, as this just in, like five seconds before we started rolling, uh, it, the skies opened up and started pouring on our kids. So they're going to be extra wet and coming in from the outside, and you will hear lots of um, beforeing children, hopefully. So. Yeah, they were outside having fun with uh, water, and then they got poured upon. <laughs> Getting a lot of getting a lot of rain in the northeast right now. If you guys are also in the northeast. I hope you guys are surviving okay with all the tornadoes and hurricanes and everything else. Yeah, we're in Kenneth Square right now, and it's it's got hit pretty hard. Yeah, we've got um, two tornadoes. Uh, just just driving around, uh, like you have to. There's so many detours right now. It's uh, kind of crazy. Not only because of that, but also, and, and maybe you're experiencing this where you, where you live too. But everything is under construction, so construction compounded with. Destruction is, is fantastic because well, there's the thunder. You hear? Yeah, awesome. So cool. Well, so we're gonna go through the normal format. Um, the first one, I, I think I shared this. The first one we ever did was you you interviewing me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this turn of events. So uh, you you I've asked a couple times. I think Master Dan Feller asked a couple times to do one with you. And you finally said okay. I'm dodging. So here we are. Well, uh, Master Marco said hi. Hi, sir. Zaberry, yes, hello. Angelo, good afternoon. Hope everyone's doing well. Uh, so let's get started. What we usually do is kind of start with, you know, how you start your martial arts journey. So why don't you go ahead and share that with us? Sure, sure. Um, uh, these are so much easier to do from his there. You see, because you can, usually the people we're interviewing is, are much more. Uh, 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 Interesting. Let's put it that way, because their stories are go back uh, uh, in the early decades of the martial arts, and, and it's fantastic. My journey started in the 1990s, so it's not that far back. And I think some of the people that we've interviewed uh, have had legendary stories. Ours are kind of meager. And I say ours because uh, I started in 2000. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I, I think the 90s, um, 90. Five, I want to say 96 maybe is when I started and um, with Master Gawain at Korean Martial Arts Institute and uh, that was kind of like the renaissance of uh, Korean martial arts uh, it was when when some of the the greats that I consider the greats um, were, were coming out here uh, Muhammad Mabrook uh, Dante Davis Laura Myers uh, Christina uh, Sheridan then it was Francisco now um, obviously, well before us were Michelle Avaloni and, and uh, Master Waters, Master Waters, Master uh, Mabroda, Kloss. Like so, again, yeah, it was it was a nice period of time to be coming up in the martial arts. The '90s were were really cool. Um, that was when we're riding the wave from Ninja Turtles to Power Rangers, and and I was a young adolescent at the time, so I was heavily influenced by a lot of that, um, as well as the same thing that most of you guys were, the Karate Kid and. That goofy stuff, um, goofy film, and, and, and the world of uh, martial arts that way. Um, I started martial arts because a friend of mine invited me to come to a buddy day. So uh, if I could take a detour and say, if you don't run buddy days or promotional events at your studio, do it because we're both results of buddy days. <laughs> buddy days, are, I came with a friend of mine and he quit at Red Belt and I'm still going. So you never know the impact of, of, of the promotional events that you're doing at your school. Um, yeah, I came to a buddy day uh, with my friend Neil, um, signed up right there on the spot, um, was still nervous, like I, I, I had a lot of confidence issues, so I was hiding behind my mom for the first couple of classes, um, Master Guy One coaxed me out, got me training, got me confident, and you know, flash forward, and somehow I tested for Master and it was awesome. 
there's some stuff that went on in between, and uh, I'm sure that'll come up in the discussion that we'll go on. But that's where that's where we started. So, what was the? How old were you? I was ten. Ten. Okay. So that's an easy way to do the math. Let's see. Thirty-six now. It's twenty-six years ago. Twenty-six years. Yeah. Yeah. So, and shortly after, when when did you test for black belt? I tested for black belt in 1999. Um, then uh, I think there's a. Oh no, I'm talking about. I had my old Don certificate hanging up, and I had like long, long hair, and then it got longer, and then now it's here. Um, but yeah. So after you got your black belt, uh, at some point you took a break. So when when was that? Well, you took a break from Tung Sudo, you know, training, KMA training. Yes. So, um, no, I think I got my black belt in 2000 because okay. it, how, I, how I equate the time is I got it in 2000-ish, somewhere in that window, and then 2002. So I trained for two more years um, at the black belt level, um, and I was doing all the different programs that Master Godwin had offered um, in that window of time between getting start, uh, that, that black belt in 2000 and 2002 when I stopped training. Um, I got my black belt in hot keto with Master Godwin, which was an adjunct course that he added into it um, when I was a teenager. Um, and so I, there was that, but I also kind of stalled out. And maybe some of you guys have seen students do this or yourself have done this. Um, I stalled out after about two years of training in black belt, and I didn't want to take my EDON test. I didn't feel like I'd re really learned a whole lot new. I was just kind of cruising. Um, but when Master Allen started offering hop keto, I found that to be very interesting and um, really like that. that. I mean, I've obviously continued with that course too, but that was, uh, it opened my eyes and I was like, oh, there's other martial arts than just Tong Sudo. Hop Kido is really cool. It added like the, the uh, grappling side um, that I didn't think we focused on as much in Tong Sudo. Um, just a glimpse of it with Wholesome Soul, but Hop Kido was like a whole adventure in that industry. Um, so that opened my eyes, and then I started looking into other things. So come 2002, I was like, you know, I want to see what else there is. So I quit with Master Gowan, and I joined up at a Kung Fu school that a couple of my high school friends were all uh, training in. And I did that for two years, and about, a, uh, about six months into that, I started doing boxing. So I got some boxing training in um, at, a, at a, <laughs> a little rough hole in the wall place. Um, did some tough man tournaments, which are like amateur boxing uh, for junior level in high school, and um, got beat up a lot. Got also beat up a lot of people. It was, it was fun. It made me feel tough. And then, and then, um, I guess that segues into the professional martial arts career. Yeah. So it's I've definitely felt the the boxing aspect of your um, <laughs> training and sparring. Do you feel like the your kung fu training? Does that translate at all? Do you do you, do you feel like that uh, comes through in your training or your a, skill set? A really good question. I, I don't think I've ever been asked that question. I think a lot of people. It's it's a fair one. Um, all right. I don't like to speak ill about anything, but I I didn't get a lot out of the kung fu training, except and this is a big except because I could go back and say this is it's tons. What I got from Kung Fu training was it was very hard. Like every class and every class started with a minimum of two minute uh, uh, Mabu, which is horse riding stance. So my leg strength got a lot better and flexibility got a lot better in that sense. And then every class had 50 fingertip push ups. So by the end of that training course I was doing with them, I could do 50 fingertip push ups like in the blink of an eye, um, which is saying something because I can't do that now. I'm way too heavy. Uh, so the, the training was harder in some respects, um, but the most I got out of it was a lot of the stance transitions. When I came back to doing Tong Sudo, I kind of just plugged in, in the stance transitions that I had from Kung Fu, and that smoothed out a lot of the clunkier, heavier foot movements that I think um, we see in, in, in uh, novice Tong Sudo practitioners. And you've seen it when you're watching your students do like Seggy Hyung's at an early level and they got that big foot stomping thing and everything's detached and they, they, their weight goes up and down. Kung Fu had us doing a lot of fluid low stances and low stance transitions and that translated really well back to Tung Sudo after I had a little bit of training. I never thought about that until you mentioned it too. too. That's it. No, that's a good thing and I think I got it through, I guess, Master Gowan's Tai Chi kind of leanings. So it's the same thing? It's, you know, yeah, absolutely the same thing but 
it was interesting to me to, to think about that part. Now, we'll go a little farther. You've also done a good bit of sword training. Mm-hmm. Where did that where did that interest come? Well, um, I'm sure everybody that's going to watch this has some interest in sword. Like it's it's kind of in our nature as martial artists. Um, so, I was always interested. In, oh, look at these people. Hello, everybody. I'm sorry, we're missing a bunch of hellos. Um, always interested in sword and uh, did just like whatever I could with Master Godwin. Um, no, I, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll give a lot more credit to Master Godwin. So Master Godwin did teach us some basics with swords. Um, he he and Master Vaughn kind of put together the sword forms that we use now as uh, Kicho Jangam Hyung and Jungup Jangam Hyung. They, they were really the, the progenitors of, of creating that type of, of, of form. So we got to see a lot of that movement earlier on and, and Tim knows some of the forms that um, kind of set the way for the, 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 the where they came from. Um, and I think, I, I know I was a blue belt, so this would have definitely been 1999. Master Godwin and Grandmaster Mackenzie uh, from Sinmu Hapkido uh, brought in a master from Korea who, um, I, I don't remember all the details, and if I say any of them, I know Master Godwin's gonna be like, oh, you got that wrong. But um, all I remember was he was about five foot nothing, uh, bald Korean that spoke very little English. And he brought us a form that we now call Shibam Jangam Hyung, but I think Master Godwin says it's like Moyodo Tanji 24, it's the 24th form, and the Moyodo Tanji is a sword form. And we did it in a field for three hours. So this is my first major exposure to sword. I was, I was like 14, 15 years old, it's 1999, and I did this sword form in, a, in an open field, and I did it so much that my right hand, get it in camera, like this whole area right here that, that makes heavy contact to the sword when you're holding it in proper grip was bleeding and blistered. Like the, they gained blistered and then they bled and I went home and I showed my mom and she was horrified because you're like, what the heck did you do for the last three hours? Mom, I'm bleeding, this is awesome, and it's sword. <laughs> and uh, I told that story uh, recently to Master Godwin and he chuckled, he was like, that's, I mean, that's, that, that's to be expected. But um, that was my first exposure, and I think that was really where the love of swordsmanship came from. And then working with Dojin Ji Han Jae, he had a lot of sword techniques and a lot of sword philosophy with Sin Mohap Kido. Um, so flash forward to, I want to say 2005 or six. Um, I was working, uh, running a school for Master Godwin in Bucks County, uh, very close to where Master Gordon School is, and. Um, and um, there was a uh, Heidong Gondo school in the area, and the guy that was running it, whose name was Master Kim, like, not that that narrows it down, but um, he was the, um, the regional, the U.S. director of Heidong Gondo. So I got to train directly and earn to him for about two years. I did that. Um, so I have some rank. It's gup rank, but it, I have some rank in Gondo. Um, and then... Uh, they changed our class schedule. It overlapped with the class schedule that we were running for our tongue course, and I wasn't able to continue with that. Um, but through the world of martial arts, Master Godwin, one of his friends from Europe and um, a original World Tongue Sudo member, uh, Master Lee, he uh, reconnected with Master Godwin. He, he comes to, to Delaware every year, every summer, um, and reconnects with Master Godwin. And in that time, Master Godwin introduced him and I together, and because I'd had the gumdo training, and Master Lee has experience with gumdo, we connected, and then I've kind of been training with him every summer since then. I, I don't remember when that was. Do you remember the first time? Um, I would guess early 2010s, like yeah. somewhere in that range would be my guess, somewhere in that time frame, maybe a little earlier. So I don't um, hold any Don rank in swordsmanship, but it, it's just accumulated mass over years and years of... Yeah, I would say for me as as one of your training partners, ha- you having those skills has helped made me a better swordsman, martial artist, and I, I, I think across the board, a lot of the people that we work with would say the same. Um, you know, you can talk about, we're going to talk about HDL later, but I'm sure yeah. that that's influenced a lot too. So, um, real quick, just want to say hi to some of the people that are, uh, Brian Burkett, uh, Lindsay uh, from Great Britain, she's been... Uh, Checking in on a lot of the interviews that uh, I've done. Cindy Jones is in Alaska. Yes. Yoshi Oda, Brian Ormiston, Master McCarty from Mobile. Hello, sir. And uh, Tom Lyons. If anyone has any questions for Master S, feel free to, to shoot them along. 
Um, I haven't been nervous until we just saw that name, <laughs> list of names. Yeah, right. Oh, no, don't uh, worry. It's all good. They're 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 here to just listen along. Um, so I pushed forward a little bit on the sword, but let's go back. So you took that break. Um, mm -hmm. Was there a point where you actually took a break from martial arts? No, I never okay. stopped training. So um, that's a good point too. Like I, I use that in my um, conversation with kids when we get to that quitting point. I'm like, look, I, I completely agree. Like you get to a point in high school where you want to try another sport or you you want to do this or high school ends and you're going to college. Mm -hmm. I get it. I get it. I do that too. My love for martial arts kept me going with it. I, I've never stopped. So from 10 years old till now, it's been constant martial arts training. It's not all Tung Sudo. Right. Um, but I, I use that quite a bit. I don't take... I, yeah. yeah, taking a break from martial arts. It's, for example, the last three months when we're in COVID, right. that 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 has been the most detrimental in the 26 years I've done martial arts. Um, just because, like, I miss that camaraderie. I miss that 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 training with physical partners mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But other than that, no, no breaks. So, uh, the, any chance we'll ever see long hair again? Do you see these bald <laughs> patches up here, Yoshi? I don't think it can grow back. Actually, uh, two weeks ago, I had long hair, and then I got it cut uh, last Monday because it was just getting long and thin. And I was like, this just looks like a sad attempt of an old man clinging to youth. So, I'm like, I'm, not that I'm old, but uh, it looked it. So, that's the next step that he's got right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I got the same thing. Uh, uh, so, one of the things when I came on as an instructor for Master Godwin, one of the stories that he always talked about was going to uh, a restaurant <laughs> that you worked at and and bringing you back into the fold and, and, and getting you in, on the floor as an instructor. Were, were you an instructor or did you help out at all before you, you stopped? And, and tell us about that story and how you got back into... Uh, training at KMAI. Okay. So, um, yes, uh, at about, I want to say, brown or red belt, I, I started helping out at the Dojang, and what Master Godwin had was uh, the SWAT team, the students with the aptitude to teach, or the special, special winning attitude team. Um, I kind of went through a couple different evolutions there. But um, back when there was the SWAT team, that's what I was doing. And um, to give another shout out, like, I was following in direct footsteps of Muhammad Mabro because he was like an inspiration. He got his red top, he was teaching at the studio, and I, I, I seriously thought Muhammad was like 10 years my senior because he had like a full goatee. <laughs> He's, he and I are almost exactly the same age, but he had a full goatee like as early as I can remember. And so I thought that this older guy with the red top, I want to be just like him, and ended up we're the same age. And so followed in his footsteps, was part of SWAT and Storm. And um, not, not Storm, Storm didn't exist yet. But um, and then when Master Godwin bought the new facility, um, which uh, I think a lot of you guys either know about by reputation or have been there, um, um, <laughs> give up with <laughs> shape. <laughs> Good point. Uh, uh, when Master Godwin um, uh, moved his studio, uh, I was there four nights a week from four o'clock to 9 p.m. My mom would drop me off and then just pick me up at the end of the night. And uh, she'll, she'll tell the story, like the greatest day was when I got my license and she didn't have to do that drive anymore. And she didn't have to sit in the lobby and, 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 and stay for hours on end. So yeah, I was, a, I was a dojo rat is I think the term that they use. I was in the school for, for too long and it was great. And then, so then I took a break and didn't really help out at the other schools because I was a, a minor student. I was a you know a beginner level student. And then um, in high school, I was working at a restaurant with some of my other family members in a historic community, historic Newcastle. And it was one of the places that Master Gollum would frequent to go and uh, have meals. Um, and so I would see him regularly. It wasn't like just one time. So he would come in, come in, and you know, I would talk to him every single time. He would ask what was going on with my life, what am I doing, how's school going what my plan is, and then when I, I, near the end of senior year, he was like, what's your plan? I'm like, I'm gonna go into school for education. He was like, yeah, you could do that, and you could rack up you know, a couple couple dollars in student loan debt, and take three to five years after that to really get a teaching position and make any money, or you could come work for me now, and you could make this amount. And I was like, whoa, like, that was very forward, very direct. And so I said, yes, sir, I'll think about it. And that was about, that was about, 
uh, May or, or maybe a little earlier, uh, April or May of, uh, of that year, 2002. And I remember I took the summer off because I wanted to, I knew I was going to go back to Master Gallon, but I wanted to have the summer just to goof off after senior year, it was my first year not having to worry about going back to school. And I went back to Master Gallon at the end of August, and he was like, and she's turned to me, like, the hell took you so long? I gave you the offer in April. And I was like, sorry, sir. It was, I wanted to experience a, a summer without school and not without having to look into going to school. And he was like, all right, well, you start Monday. And I was like, oh, okay. Or no, it was, you start Saturday. I was like, oh, okay, that's great. It's this weekend. And that Saturday was a Dom test. So my very first day back on the mat was proctoring a black belt test, not having done Tung Sudo in two years. And I messed up forms, I messed up counts, I messed up one steps. I did t like, it was, a, it was a, a crap show and I felt like really bad, but apparently it was enough to convince him to keep me on staff. So that was it. That, that sounds like a, that's a, Back in the day, KMI story. It's like, okay, throw you into the fire or into the deep end. <laughs> into the deep end, yeah, that's right. Sink or swim. <laughs> um, I always remember you were like you said. It was like 2002. I got my black belt in 2004, and I went on as a part-time instructor. So I always saw you were you were just a, you were a step ahead of me, and I always looked at you as a, a role model because um, you were the part. You you went to full time. Then you're running your own studio when Master Gallman bought the Pindale studio. Mm -hmm. And that was like 05, 06, 04. 04? Okay. Yeah. So you, um, you're you up in Pindale. You're running your school. You got you and Ryan Wagner. Yeah. Um, talk, about, talk about those days because, <laughs> I, you know, you were talking about, all the guys we are we have Tuesday trainings. Yeah. And all the, the, the master well now masters that were on that floor were just amazing. That that yeah, time it's kinda of crazy to think back to that. Like we didn't realize how special that was mm -hmm. at that time. But that was like oh man. In terms of like being on the floor and training with just powerhouses and everybody just really just like right. destroying it on the mat. Every week. Every week. Every <laughs> Tuesday without fail. Like you don't miss those Tuesday classes, otherwise yeah. you get reamed by Master Allen. Yeah. Man, that was that was cool. Uh, so the the that morning workout, like on a given Tuesday, would be Rob Kloss, George Maybroda, uh, Joe Kaluzny, um, and then some of the Laura Myers, Jason Church, Jason Church, Master Chris Roman. Sheridan, Master Roman. Uh, we can keep going. Uh, yeah, John Smith, John Dante, Smith, Dante Davis, Irwin, yeah, Master Waters, Muhammad Bob Rose, uh, Master Waters, yeah, Muhammad, Tim, Master Watson, Godwin, <laughs> Patrick Priest, Master Godwin, myself, my wife. Ryan Wagner. Ryan Wagner. Oh my God! Like, like that was like, to be on the mat. Like we didn't appreciate it. None no. of us appreciated it. None of us gave it any credit whatsoever. And like now we'll look back at photos and be like, that was that was the time to be training. Mm -hmm. um, not that there's any bad time to train, but that was there, like anybody on that floor could have cleaned your clock, and it was just cool. It was just neat. Um, I, I, I kind of got stuck reminiscing and I forgot what the question was. So, uh, so we were talking about that time frame of mm -hmm. your, your teaching, like, you know, being, being out in Pendel, kind of on an island. Yeah. Uh, when you look at the other schools that Master Gowan had, we're all in Delaware mostly. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about some of those, those yeah. moments and memories. Okay. So um, uh, there was a joke between Patrick Priest and I because we were both <laughs> running... Um, well, for lack of a better term, they were satellite schools, but they were still schools. So Delaware is here, and Dover, Delaware is here, and Pendel was here. So Patrick Priest and I always said that we're the northern and southern uh, like uh, outposts of the of the Khmer Empire, the Korean Martial Arts Empire. And um, so there was a bit of a uh, a feeling like we were like kind of we left to our own devices. So we kind of. We did things our own way, and it, for better or worse, it worked, and it was fun, and we had a great time. Working with Ryan, he, he's an inspirational person. He trains, I think, harder than, or maybe maybe not harder than Muhammad, but he trains probably harder than almost anybody else. Prob there. They're probably pretty close. Yeah, probably pretty close. So, you know, being around inspiring people like that is fantastic. Given the opportunity to run a school when I was that young, in hindsight, I'm like, wow, Master Gawain was nuts, because like, I was young and dumb and... and, and but having said that, we took over the school. It was, it was owned by Don Drum, uh, Master Don Drum, who was a charter member of the Walton Association. Um, and he was an avid businessman. 
he he had at one point a school with 400 students. It was that school. It was huge. Um, it actually we were in the facility that he used to run the 400 students at before um, Team Toyota bought it out and we moved into a smaller location. But uh, and that facility was huge. It was, it was gigantic. Um, but the property was sold. Master Gowan had to move to school, and that's when I was taking it over around that time. Um, so we moved to a slightly smaller location, and the school had dwindled a little bit, so it was down to, I know the, the, the money number, but I can't remember the head count. Uh, but in any case, Brian Wagner and I grew that school to a very significant amount. By 2006, it was, it was a booming school, it was, it was rocking. Um, about that time, the recession hit, the bubble burst, and we lost a lot. We took a big hit, just like, just like kind of like what we're seeing now in, in the present world. Um, and we, we we took a step back, and a lot of things kind of a domino effect happened. A couple things went south, and you know it just it was it was draining. Um, Ryan Wagner went on, moved on to do other things. He later came back to martial arts, got his masters and things like that back underneath Don Drum. Um, but in terms of what happened at the school. It, it went down. Um, we still kept it afloat. I think I, I still have some great students. Some people that might even be watching right now, like uh, Mike Albero, was one of our one of our earlier black belts at that, with that program, and now he's a master uh, and runs the school. So he purchased that school from Master Gowan and is now Hidden Gem. So the school still exists. It's it's gone through a couple different owners and operators, which might be a good segue here too. Um, and uh, it, it it it's there. It's it's thriving. I still love those people. I try to hang out with them at least once a month, the people that are up north, uh, my, my good friends that are up there. Mm -hmm. um, it, it also created relationships. I see Faith Gordon's on here. You know, she was always somebody I looked up to in that area and her father, they were right down the road. So, you know, there was, it, it, it created a lot of awesome links. Um, I would say that that was a major stepping stone to get where we are now. So we, You talked about Mike, there's just touch base on uh, him being like the, he's the first guy that was one of your students yeah, going nice. to master, right? Yeah, and, and that's really weird too, because <laughs> there's a significant, not significant, that makes him, he's gonna kill me for saying that. There's a, there's <laughs> he's a, old. And there's an age gap between Mike and I. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Master Godwin said when I took over that job, he was like, look, we're gonna sit down. He's like, you're gonna be in charge of people that may be your senior in age and senior in rank but you have to still be the guy, you have to be the instructor. So you have to carry yourself in a certain way that is authoritative to those people so that they understand who's the boss, but also respectful to them so that you under, they understand that you're still giving them credit for their age, rank, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was always significant, that, that sticks with me to this day. Um, and that's still how I operate everything, because you never know, I mean, you have to be hum humble, and have humility and all that, but um, so uh, yeah, uh, so Mike was, a father of a dragon that we had who made it to black belt in second, second degree. I can't remember. Um, um, so his son Julian was taking it and his wife uh, was also taking it and uh, Denise. And so Denise and Mike joined in shortly after, became black belts. Denise was helping us teach at the school. She got to second degree black belt and then Mike just, just kept going. And then uh, we had a nice hug at, at regionals last year, October last year, when he got his fourth degree master. And it was just one of those realizations. Holy cow! Like I don't know how, I don't I don't know how this process goes on other than just keep tying your belt on, showing up, and teaching. And then eventually you'll have students that may get to master, and you'll go, I don't know how this happened. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I became a master. Right. That matter. It's just fun. A faith you said is an important lesson. And looking back when you were talking about that, I remember when I was an instructor, I was a secondary black belt. I would I taken over Kenneth Kenneth Kenne Square after Muhammad. Yeah. And I was so nervous, but then people like Craig Hennessy and Gary Kirk and Aaron, my wife Aaron, would show up and take class with me, and they outrank me, you know, far outrank me. And that gave you know they're like, we're here to take your class, like you, you're the instructor, we're gonna take your class, and that gave me the the confidence to to do that. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's a, a a great story. So. You said the segue. Uh, Chuck says, "Miss you up here." Yeah, um, Tom Lyons asks, "How did Legacy Martial Arts come about?" So we're we're getting, you know, we pushed up closer to that timeline. But go ahead and uh, and, and talk about how you you ended up here at Legacy. Yeah, that's a that's a detailed one. As <laughs> you can tell, these stories are long. I'm long winded. I get that gift, I think, from Master Godwin too. We tell good stories. Um, but uh, so. 
what's neat is you're, you're sitting here watching two people that both taught out of this office and out of this facility. Like uh, Tim was my predecessor here. Uh, and before that, it, or not after that, but before me still was Master Brown. So uh, this school itself has gone through uh, a good amount of instructors, um, including, the, you already mentioned, um, Mohamed Mabrook, and before that, Rob Kloss, mm -hmm. Erwin Waters. I think a lot of people had their hands in in running the school when it was Korean Martial Arts Kenneth Square. Um, I actually, uh, one of the, my biggest regrets was when Master Gowan opened the school in 2006, he had um, a gathering of senior grandmasters that was, uh, it was legendary and I wish that more people knew about it, but um, Dojinim Jihan Jae, the founder of Hapkido, um, Grandmaster Shin, and Dr. Hyun Kim, who is Han, Han Mudo, right? Han Mudo. Han Mudo. Um, as well as uh, um, Master Jansa, and I'm sure I'm leaving some Donald people. Kim was here. Too. Donald Kim, yeah, yeah, his son, who's mm -hmm. uh, the, the next in line. Uh, I, I feel like I'm missing some some very important names, but let's just leave it that with those five powerhouses alone. It was this historic event, and um, it had been the first time that some of these grand masters had met each other in decades, and uh, they came out for the grand opening of the school in 2006. And I wanted to be here. I know you were here, right? I was here, yeah. And I think Aaron was here too, right? Mm -hmm. And Master Godwin said, no, you have to run the Dojang. You cannot come to this. And I was like, oh, man, I was crippled. But I knew of the significance of the event, and uh, I think all of us knew that this school here in Kenneth Square was going to be a great one. Um, and it was. Uh, Master Kloss worked very hard to, to, to get it up and running, get it started. Um, the efforts from Mohammed Mabrook and Master Waters and Tim and Matt, they just, it just kept growing, growing, growing. And then, so it was very easy to step into when we decided to reach out to Master Gowan and purchase a business from him in 2015, 14 when it started, but we didn't finish until 2015. Uh, and we were in negotiations to purchase one of his schools, and he was like, I'll tell you what, you know, this is going to work out better for you. This is going to be a better fit, Kenneth Square. And I, Again, I never really come up to Kenneth Square. I don't know this area too well. Um, but I took his word for it. I trust him. He's my instructor, my mentor, my surrogate father out there. And I'm like, all right, sir, if you think this is a good fit, we looked into it. And we're like, we can do this. And so it's about 30 minutes from home to here, which is not huge. Um, uh, when I was teaching that in Bucks County, it was like an hour or 15 uh, long car ride. So that was a long commute. If you were lucky. If you were lucky. The 95 get, traffic. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, it, was a, it was definitely an easier commute and an easier community. So we wanted to meet the people in it, came in for a couple weeks to teach, and um, we were like, yeah, this is, this is going to be a good fit. All of our Korean martial arts family that we have, um, we, still, we still have the same level of connection just because we're legacy and he's evolution. It's still we're Kamai. And so you know, we know the cultures at our schools are very similar. So once we experienced that and made the commitment to purchase it, we just told Master Allen, yeah, we're serious about this. Got some capital, presented it to him, and he was like, yeah, absolutely. And then we became Legacy Martial Arts in 2015. Actually, this month marks our five, five years. So August 1 is when we purchased it officially. It's amazing. Um, you've obviously had lots of highs right now it's a low, yeah. <laughs> with COVID-19 uh, this year hasn't been the, the greatest um, but congratulations on the fifth anniversary uh, talk talk about working through the and we'll go back and talk about other stuff but since you just brought it up the adversity of 2020 and yeah, uh, hurts. <laughs> the highs and lows I you know I, I, I know personally we, we have a text chain where a lot of the instructors talk and, um, you know, I, I, sometimes I, I laugh my head off <laughs> looking at the messages. Sometimes I want to cry. <laughs> so there's Master Eddie Stum is one of the <laughs> most hilarious people in all the world. That's right. But, um, yeah, so we have a little chat group that just, you know, we grieve our, our we, we air our grievances with our woes at the time. And, you know, it's a, it's a hard time, but, you know, um, somebody I, I very highly value uh, their opinion said something recently and it, it really stuck with me. Um, he's a master and I won't say it just in case this is a, this is a taboo topic, but he's, uh, we asked, how you doing? And he's like, well, I've had the same year you've had, but my son died. And I was like, oh my God. Like, I could gripe about 2020 and the hurdles that we're facing right now 
we had a tough time in 2006 as well, yeah. and the martial arts industry looked really like like beat up. Like we didn't, we felt beat up too. Like we go into the schools and like man, people don't want to take karate anymore. Like you feel like you wasted all this education that you had. But then things turned around, and uh, things could be way worse. Like you know what I mean? Like when this guy said that, I was like, man, that that was a gut punch. Where it stinks, man. Like we 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 grown the school. We had. I'll, I'll be upfront with you guys. This is, this is something that not numbers to hide. When we started, all right, the March it was we were up to 270 students. We were we were doing well, and we just looked like a couple minutes ago before we started this thing, and we're down to 138 students. So we're down, you know, 50 percent of our active count was hit, and I get it. Like there are more important things to worry about than how many students are in the dojo. But you know, the industry as a martial arts instructor. It, it, it's, a, it's a scary time, but it's also the time that we have to show our resilience, show our perseverance and our indomitable spirit and just keep keep going on, keep marching on. All, right, all the noise you hear in the background are our campers that are, are here. So we're having summer camp and we're doing it with masks on. We're sitting without masks on right now, but they all have masks on and we're yeah. social distancing. <laughs> and um, yeah, so there's that. Um, difficult, but we're alive and we can be happy about that, right? So there's that. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point, being an instructor, and it's one of those, it's like, man, I've done this for a long time. You you reference the highs and lows, like that time in the 06 or 07 was, was really rough, and I don't know if it was is just, as, well, no, it probably was if just as rough, if not uh, for a longer, a longer period, because mm -hmm. um, I remember that I was here at that time that's basically oh, right here. That's when we oh. we opened oh, yeah. in 05 yeah. here in 2005. So Master Gowan basically just kept this kept it going, uh, you know, however he could, um, you know. And like you said, it this is it's different. We're gonna have to figure it out. We are figuring it out uh, as we go every day, but um, we'll continue to to do that. Uh, Right along the same time as COVID nineteen happened, um, you w accepted a new role in uh, World Tung Sudo Association. Yeah. Uh, so uh, talk about that. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a, a absolute honor, and the the faces I'm making are just because I took over this position in a time where I can do nothing with it. <laughs> so I <laughs> I kind of feel like oh this is amazing. I can't do anything. <laughs> um, and and the position was. Um, um, director of Business and Finance for World Tongue Sudo Association, uh, and which is a position that my instructor, Master Gawain, used to hold within World Tongue Sudo Association. So it was neat to step into his legacy and um, and take a step that direction. But uh, it, it's a it's a it's a huge honor, and it gives you know uh, an opportunity to share some business insight or, or things that were helping our school grow prior to COVID nineteen. Uh, but now I think it, it takes on an important role too because it's just about how we're, how can we survive this? What can we do to pivot? And um, it, the reason I chuckle is because uh, you know we've been doing everything we can to keep you know if there's a hole in the boat we have the buckets right now and we're just mm -hmm. throwing water out. And so that's taken I, I would say more than 100 percent of my time and my wife's time uh, in order to keep this ship afloat um, given the change of events and, and things that are going on in the world. So I haven't done a whole lot with this position, but my goal is to hopefully have some success stories to share with other martial arts owners, uh, business owners, school owners, to give you some tools and resources to make it out of this craziness on the better side. Um, I didn't want, I, I felt odd sharing information when I didn't know, because this is all an unknown. Like, I can't say, yeah, do this, absolutely, because I know it'll work with when I'm just beta testing it myself. Um, so now that the things are, are working and we've pivoted and we've shifted our focus and we've adapted to the circumstance, I think it's I think we're getting to that time where I can actually do some good with this new position and this new title that it carries with it a lot of weight and making sure that people in our association can use it for some guidance to progress. I, I hope, I hope we'll see. I mean, hopefully this I'll do the job until they find somebody better to do it. Is what I keep telling you. <laughs> I think even still in the midst of a pandemic, I've definitely seen some, you know, some victories, you know, to a certain degree. You still, you see people 
uh, you know, adjusting to their circumstances and, and still doing great out there. Um, you know, Master Tracy, they did a, a, a virtual tournament on Zoom, um, and they did CIT where uh, they had instructors from all over the world a part of it. You know, you, and you can name other people that have it's like, all right, yeah, this this happened, but you know what? So what? We're gonna keep doing what we do, and um, that's one of the things that I like about being friends with you. You you pivoted to the summer camp, and you you had you had already doubled down on it before everything happened. Yeah. But you're like, all right, I don't care. We're gonna figure it out, right? And then you you go with the flow. You adjust to it, wearing masks and things like that. Um, yep. So uh, if anyone has questions. Yeah. Friend this guy, friend this guy on Facebook, send yeah, him a message. Please. Because honestly, even if he can't give you an answer, I assure you he will get you an answer. Yeah. <laughs> right? He'll get you an answer or push you in the right direction. So, um, the best connector out there. I will find somebody. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, the, there's resources out there. You have the, um, the Facebook group. Mm -hmm. the, the, the owners group there's an owners group if you're not a part of um, you have to ask to be approved to get into that group but if there's somebody out there that's watching that isn't uh, that is a club or studio owner that is not part of it I strongly recommend it there's good information that you shared I have to give some credit here too I, I can't believe I'm 40 minutes into it having said this but um, and probably Tim can attest too like anything that I say in this video about giving information or stuff we're supported by some of the best people out there and not just I'm not just talking about my instructors I'm talking about like my wife Anna is, is Annalisa Setianto is the multitask queen and uh, I'm hyper focused and she's multi focused she can do 50 different things at once and um, so yeah if you have questions that I can't answer because I don't know Excel I'll point you towards her or whatever it might be um, so I think we go through these interviews sometimes and I mean in every interview that I, I did earlier on too I was like you know, your spouse is significant in this, in the in the production of your school, but, but contribute, con contributing in their association. I talked to Nicole Peterman, like she's the, the kind of, like, uh, Ken Peterman is amazing, but his wife is just as amazing, you know what I mean? And sometimes they don't get, they don't get the shout outs. Same, uh, Aaron and Tim are a powerhouse couple. Uh, you can name a whole bunch of them that are, that are great that way. So props to the wives and the husbands out there that are supporting each other. Absolutely. There she is. Yeah. I'll get her on here for an interview okay. one of these days. When you guys um, are so when our Tuesday's classes are turning. <laughs> Angel, I am down because I am up in That's other right. areas. <laughs> down to trade. That's right. So uh, Tom mentioned, and you mentioned it too, about doing the interviews. I, I'd had this idea for you know a while and no you you <laughs> you finally you're like yeah let's i'm gonna do it and so the the first one we we did together yeah. uh we thought we could uh connect on facebook live I think 15 didn't minutes of it, it was just us screwing it up uh but talk talk about doing those interviews and like you yeah. said you talked about you know working with someone like master they're talking to master law or master peterman um you know, it's just listening to the history of all those people, um, it's, it's just amazing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, so yeah, let, let's dissect that a little bit. And it might be like an advert for future ones too. Um, so Tim and I had this conversation. It was at one of your pool parties like earlier on. I'm like, yeah, it would be really neat to do this. Um, it might have been years ago too, because it, it, it I've talked about it. A it's over times. and over again. But it, it was a neat idea because it's like a time capsule for those people that, you know. Um, you know, God willing, are, are still going to be around for a while. But if they're not, there has to be some log of their story or, or, or some information about where they came from or their views or philosophies. And um, and then it made even more poignant when Grandmaster Bodwin passed away. Mm -hmm. And that was right before COVID-19. And like, so th these events happened and Tim and I were talking and I was just like, why are we waiting, man? Like, especially now with nothing to do in right. March. We're like, let's just do it. Let, let, let's jump in and let's just do these interviews because people are gonna need some dose of martial arts and if it's not physical training, maybe they can get some mental training from hearing from interesting people or, or influential people. So it started small, grassroots, we just had a conversation. And then uh, and then I think it was, a, I, I did Master Godwin and then Muhammad. These are all, you can find all of these. I'm not, I'm not just, um, just listing them off out there, but we did kind of like our home crew that we all knew, but we're also influential people within World Tongue Sudo. 
and then it just kept going and then like I don't know it, it tipped and then everybody started to do them you started to do them Master uh, Dan Farley started to do some of those uh, up in, in Region 9 and then Master Jurgensen and uh, Joel, yeah. So the, it's awesome. Now, now more than ever, we have a resource of collecting these time capsules of, or video capsules, really, of, of, of these people that, you know, I'm never wishing anything ill to anybody, but at least there's some rec, uh, something to bring back of, of their views and opinions, which is why I'm like, I don't know why I should be on one of these videos. Like, you guys don't need my opinion. You need... Uh, Master Vaughn's was a really good one because he's one of these just legendary figures figures within Wal Tung Sado. And we have a couple other people that we're trying to get. So I know some people out there are like, hey, there's some senior ranking people like Master Chambliss and, and uh, we're, things are in the works, right? Like yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're, we're turning gears. We're, right. Um, <laughs> the messages have been sent out yes, to some people. Yeah. We, we, will, we will do everything we can to get the, the real legends out there. Sure. Um... I thought man, just uh, it just went away. Um, we'll go ahead and talk to the, talk about this before, uh, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll it'll come back yeah, to me. Yeah, sure. So one of the things that you've been a part of for a, a while now is the Power Non League, oh, yeah, the HDL, yeah. and I, I think that's something that is important to touch on. Um, oh, I know what it was. I'll get. Uh, but let's go ahead and talk about um, HDL. Yeah, HDL, and and and. Because you you posted a picture recently, uh, missing missing those guys. Um, so, that part. Yeah. <laughs> so go ahead and talk about uh, your, your history and, and all the awesome stuff you've had an opportunity to do through that. That, that was a weird one. Um, it's a, it's an amazing program. I shouldn't start it off with that, but it was weird to get the nudge about it. Um, so for those of you guys that don't know, the Huang Dan League is like the best of the best in youth martial arts within World Tung Sudo Association. It really is a fantastic, fantastic experience. Um, Giselle Sharp, Master Giselle Sharp, she has put together a team of young people that are, I, I can't imagine, like I mentioned earlier in this interview how inspiring it was to be on the floor with all these legendary people on a Tuesday morning workout. If you go back and say this, I know these kids that are part of this HDL team are going to say the same thing because they're pulled from not only, or the first one was just our country, and now it's, you know, it's from a bunch of different countries. But these kids are the best of the best of the best. So when they're training together, it is insane. Like, to be a coach on that team, imagine, like, your two or three best students at your school. The ones that you only have to tell to do one thing, to do something one time, and then they do it not only well, but they do it, and you're like, oh my god, okay, well, now I can teach you three steps further from that. The whole team is like that. So you tell them to do something that you think is relatively advanced and they crush it and they look at you like they're hungry for more and you're like, oh my God, all right, let's, uh, let's pull out the, the special stuff, the, the reserves. That's how amazing these kids are and it's just a neat environment and they're so supportive and they're so kind and they're so um, uplifting towards, towards, towards each other that they get better and better. So the, the team is going on now several years and it's, it's got its own momentum now. Um, but when, we, when I was first asked to do it, um, I got a call from Giselle and she was like, hey, I've got this program, would you be interested? And I was like, I, sure, I don't know what capacity I can be. Um, in particular, she was looking for a sword, uh, sword instructor. So I put together a form that has been used in a couple different ways, and that was kind of like my video submission, my video interview. And uh, it was liked well enough that it, it ended up on the team and, and, and as part of the core curriculum. But um, it, was, it was neat, it was just a neat interview. And um, you know, my, my cohorts with this are, Mohammed Mabrook, Sunny Gebhardt, and Osaya Robinson, who are all now masters, which is fun to say. Um, but at the time, I think uh, I was a fourth on, and Mohammed was the only master of our crew. And um, but uh, it introduced me to those. Well, Mohammed and I grew up together, but uh, the other two instructors, who are really like brother and sisters, like it, when we're together, it's it's, it's, a, it's an amazing experience. I don't, I don't know how to talk about it, but you guys know within World Tongue Sudo, you, there's people that like. You might not see him for a year or two, but the minute you're standing next to him again, it's like no time has passed, and you're right back in the same shoes and the same same feeling, and it, it's it, it's an amazing thing. And the things that it's doing for the kids, like it's better than anything I ever did, and I love my martial arts upbringing. So, like, it kind of kind of makes it dwarfs it, and then that, that's what I can say. Very positive, of course. 
Um, we had to cancel this year's because World Championship was canceled, so we missed this year's get together. But um, hopefully, 2021 will bring better things. I think I covered that right. Yeah, Mr. Clusey keeps mess. Uh, do you need evolution magnets to cover up? You guys, I think. So this is a quick inside <laughs> joke. Everywhere I go, these guys throw a magnet on my car, and I leave it on there as a joke. So in the back of my car right now, is I have a Master Kaluzny Evolution magnet on the back of my car. I have my logo, and then I have Efren Valentin threw one on the back of my car when I was up in Region 9. And I just leave them on there because I think it's hilarious. But um, yeah, my car is starting to look like a NASCAR <laughs> car off for martial arts schools. I'd be happy to accept any other magnets or stickers from your schools if you have them. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> $5 each or two for 20 that's a <laughs> master K. Constant salesman. Yeah. Um, so the, the thing I was talking about earlier, um, you mentioned Grandmaster Shin when you talked about the grand opening here. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe share some some thoughts on Grandmaster Shin, uh, you know, growing up in World Tung Sudo and Region 8, you got a chance to, to see him. I don't know if you had a lot of personal interactions, but... Uh, yeah, share some stories on uh, your, your Grandmaster Shin uh, experience. Um, so I, I'm glad that I can do this now. I, I, I was in uh, Region 5 at the Don Clinic a couple months back. Or I guess it's a year. Sure. Oh, my yeah. God. Um, and somebody, they, they blindsided me with that question. I'm like, oh. Uh, but I have the stories ready now because I had to think of them in that circumstance. Um, uh, like Faith Gordon, I started in this... Uh, martial arts journey as a child and I've come up now through not only adulthood but it's my professional career um, so I, I've gotten to see it from a bunch of different spectrums like I had pictures of Grandmaster Shin when I was the little kid that got his Dobok sign you know and I had a bowl cut and braces and it was hilarious um, so thinking back to that you know he was that legendary figure that you would just get an autograph from and it was amazing and he made it personal but it's still removed and then I think my first times where I felt like I not only gotten his attention, but like there was some mutual interaction. Um, we had done um, a performance, a creativity performance at Region 8 when it was in Fernwood. Uh, and I was, I was with Ryan Wagner at the time. Um, and he was Spider-Man and I was the Green Goblin. And uh, instead of using a mask, we did stage makeup. So my face was like colored green. Uh, and we'd won the event, and I had to go into the bathroom to wash off the green paint so that I could compete. And my ring was already starting, so they were like, hurry up, go change, and come back out and compete. And so I, I'm in the bathroom, and I'm scrubbing my face, and um, the security detail for Grandmaster Shin comes in, and they clear the bathroom. And I'm literally like soap on face, green makeup running, and I'm like, I can't, I, 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 my competition is starting, can I wash? And then Grandmaster Shin, without waiting for the security detail to finish cleaning, just walks into the bathroom. And then so I'm like, hello, sir, hello. Like, the, and then he, he laughed in his typical laugh. And then he, he, he looks over, still chuckling, and he goes, that was very good, very good. And then he stood there for a second. And uh, it's obviously made an impression on me, but he stood there for a second quiet. He's like, you, uh, you're very good. Like, you uh, like Dante, but uh, stronger. And that was like a huge compliment because you know my admiration to Dante sure, Davis. Yeah, and I'm like, you saying that I'm stronger than Dante Davis is wrong and, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> impressive. It was a high compliment. Um, so there was that. And uh, I, was, I, was, I was a black belt at the time, obviously, second or third degree. And, um, and then uh, around that time, it was earlier on when I was, was just starting working in Bucks County. And so I live in Delaware and I work in Bucks County, which... Philadelphia is right in the middle. So about 30 minutes into my drive is Philadelphia. And so anytime Master Godwin needed anything from World Headquarters, when Headquarters was in Philadelphia, I would be the go-to guy because I would be going up to work, stop at Headquarters, go work at Bucks County, and then on my way home, I would drop off the GUP certificates or the belts or anything that Master Godwin needed to order. That was my real, I think, in uh, experiences with Grandmaster Shin where I felt it was very personal and very meaningful um, because almost every single time when I would go through there and he would see me coming in to grab things and the lovely ladies that worked in the office, uh, Mary Rose and, and a couple of the other ladies that were up there, um, it would just be cool. Like I, I got to know them very close and if he saw even for a second he would call me into the office 
and I was always impressed because you remembered my wife, my girlfriend at the time, my girlfriend's name. Um, when we had our son, he was very interested in Kenji and, and his uh, his upbringing, and he started uh, doing this or that yet. And I was like, this guy knows everything about my family, and I just feel like a peon that's just grabbing stuff to and fro. So I think he made a lot of people feel that way. Um, surely there was, even in our interviews, we've interviewed people that had a much more significant uh, role within our association and also a relationship with Grandmaster Shin. But the neat thing is we all have, those of us that knew him around his time period, we all have those little short snippet stories where we all feel absolutely personal with him. And uh, it was special. I do have one more, actually. It's, I'm going to throw Master Claus in the bus with this one. <laughs> so right before headquarters was moved to uh, North Carolina, Master Grandmaster Shin lived in Hokes in Delaware, which is like five minutes from the, this karate school. And uh, I get a phone call. I was teaching on the mat at Pendell in Bucks County. And I, it was Grandmaster Shin. I thought it was a hoax. I really didn't think it was a joke. And I got the answering machine message. Uh, it moved to answering machine. And it was like, uh, this is a call for Jeffrey Setianto. This is Grandmaster Shin. Uh, please call me back. So, you know, I stop, have somebody run class, call Grandmaster Shin, which is just weird to say out loud. And he was like, yeah, I need your help moving. And I was like, yes, sir, anything you need. So, uh, all right, the moving truck will be here uh, 9 o'clock tomorrow. You can make it? I'm like, yes, sir, I'll be there. So I go there, and um, Master Kloss was there, and we helped him move some, some furniture and some things. And, uh, and um, he... Uh, he, he Master Kloss asked, as we're moving things, he found this cardboard cutout of Grandmaster Shin. And Master Kloss, being the, he's just a hilarious person, asked, Grandmaster Shin, can I have this? And he's like, he chuckles his normal chuckle and says, yeah, yeah, of course, go ahead. And the things that have come out of that cardboard cutout of Grandmaster Shin from Master Kloss, uh, I'll let him tell those stories. But if you, if you have an opportunity to reach out to Master Claus and ask him for a cardboard cutout Grandmaster Shin stories, they are hilarious. <laughs> they are. And I he gave that. me a case of beer. Heineken, that's what he's like, here, you can have this, I cannot drink. That's what I got. I'm sorry, I know we're getting short on time. No, it's all good. I, I remember when he lived, and it was it was just over the line in Pennsylvania, um, he would get things delivered to Hokessen, like The uh, school? Yeah, he got a, an oriental rug one time. No pulled, tax. Um, yeah, no tax. <laughs> and so he would pull up in front uh, in the van, yeah. and, and I would, he, and uh, I would bring stuff out to him, and it happened at least, Two or three times. Just um, those tiny exchanges. That's yeah. really all we had with him. I met him, uh, you know, the, the Rite Aid that was right across from where he yeah, lives? Yeah, yeah. I was going to get like, something to drink on the way home, and he was leaving like from getting a prescription. <laughs> yeah, I stopped him out. <laughs> We're walking through the door, like, hello, sir, how are you? Because <laughs> I walked, I, you know, I'm in the parking lot, and you see the van. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I, again, I, I, you know, like you said, those little stories, um, you know, are, are, are cool uh, to, to remember. So, yeah, as you mentioned, we are wrapping up. Um, any other things that you wanted to, we could probably talk another hour. Yeah, um, this is a normal conversation with Tim and I. <laughs> you know, there's there's lots of things that, that we could talk about, but um, is there anything in particular you wanna you want to end with? I know we talked about Grandmaster Shin, um, and we had the opportunity to, to go to Grandmaster Bodwin's um, yeah. funeral, and, um, so maybe, maybe. Yeah, I'll, I'll wrap it up with that. I, I mean, I don't. I hate that we're nearing the hour mark. I'm sorry for this, but uh, yeah, we can go. We can go as long as you want. <laughs> so, um, Grandmaster Shin holds. I use this term maybe too much. That that legendary status. Like he he taught the generations before us that mm -hmm. are still the, those generations are legendary to us. So Grandmaster Shin is just this this person that is almost like he's beyond reach for us. But. Um, I, I, your wife and I were, were students, or, or um, same year, coming up through Master's Clinic, which was its own very deep, um, important, significant um, time for us. And Angel Salona and a bunch of others, uh, Jolene Westrad, a whole bunch of other people that I, I, I could name for, for a dozen times. But um, it was significant because um, it was one of the first, it was not maybe the thir first year, but it was shortly after Grandmaster Shin had passed. And um, so our experience, as Kodanja coming up was underneath the Grandmaster Bodwin. Um, there's no ownership here, but like I really felt a, like maybe he was our our leader Grandmaster to, to our class sure. that was coming up. He was the principal when we were students, if you will. 
uh, Grandmaster Shin was the superintendent. He saw oversaw everything for, for, for decades before I came around. But once we um, once we started our Kodan Jaw training and we got really we, we felt that connection with Grandmaster Bowman. That's what made it so hard. And going to his funeral was was very moving, and, and I don't I don't get emotional. Um, my dad passed years ago, and, and I, I, I kind of made an internal promise like I don't cry, and and that was like. I cried then, and I was like, "That's my last time. I'm not really. I don't need to cry. I'm not. I'm not to be a tough guy. It's just I don't. I don't. I don't get that emotional about stuff. But at Grandmaster Bowden's funeral, that was the first time I was actually verklempt, and I was like, oh. I saw his billbox sitting there and his belt, and I'm like, that's how I knew him. Sure, you know, seeing him in that uniform. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm trying not to laugh. Real deep emotional conversation with Let It Go. In There's the Let It Go uh, <laughs> getting sung in the background. Um. I think for me, the the main thing that that really got to me was was seeing all the people in Region Nine, uh, you know, so broken up, and you know, uh, they they were broken up, but they were also so welcoming and accommodating. Mm-hmm. You know, Master Fairley, the Valentins, anyone Love that, yeah, yeah um, every everyone that you came up to. Gave you a hug, asked you asked you if you need anything. It was yeah, like, that was you, insane. Yeah, like, do you need anything? Is there anything I can get you? I was like, no, I can I get you here anything? to support yeah. you guys. Um, so yeah, shout out to the Region Nine family. Yeah, um, our Region Nine family. That's right. Family. <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> we're gonna ignore Master K's. Oh and, my gosh, I, yeah, I'm um, not answering that, Master K. So yeah, that that was. I was glad that we got an opportunity to go up there because I, I I feel the same way that you did. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, we'll, we'll finish on, on a, hap, uh, a happier Happy, note. Yeah. You mentioned the Master's Clinic, and that was one of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit. We, it's, my, it's, it's my interview. We can go as long as we <laughs> yeah, want. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> We're in the same area. <laughs> um, so, you talked about the Master's Clinic, and, and I, you know, it's like the HDL for adults. <laughs> so yeah. In, in, in my mind, it was, uh, you know, it's, it's that you have Black Belt Club or Black Belt Clinic, and then Master's Clinic is just a whole other experience. So, um, look forward to it. Yeah, sh- maybe share a little bit uh, of, of your experience at okay. Master's Clinic. Sure. And the the like the bonds and friendship that was. That's what I'll harp on. I mean, a lot of it has to remain. I don't want to say secretive, but yeah. like you, you want it to be special for people. Right. And if we tell you everything that's going to happen, it's not going to be as special. But um, and again, I got that from Master Valentin. Like um, one of the great bonds that I created was with. Um, um, Mr. Valentin, uh, Mr. Val, uh, Mr. O. Valentin, Orlando Valentin, um, and he's like a training partner, a brother from another region type deal. Uh, but we we went through the course together, and he said, "My brother didn't tell me nothing. Like he, he he didn't give me any prep for this whatsoever because he wanted it to be a complete surprise and all that." Um, but uh, so yeah, what are you going to get from it? I, maybe you guys. Uh, I imagine that most of the people watching this are at least black belt and. I'm sure coming up in your school, you've developed brotherhood, sisterhood with those people that you've trained around. Um, the one thing that's like it significantly changes, it, it is like a boot camp, like m- military style. You go to a uh, master's clinic and you're stripped down, you're black belt. Yeah, you're a black belt, that's it. You're not even a third belt, you're just a black belt. Like you, you're here to learn, you're here to be humble, you're here to listen, not talk, you're here to. To, to be a student again and to not share but you know soak it all in and with that is a really humbling experience where you're the people that you're in it with are are all broken down the same way so you know if you're all bearing all and there's nothing separating you well then the only thing that that's there is camaraderie and so um, there there were bonds that were formed in my first year at master's clinic that I think are were, were either made stronger because I already knew, knew the people or just forged that are, are unbreakable and um, I mentioned some of them like um, Aaron and I have known each other for a decade or two before I went to clinic but that was when Aaron and I became tight um, and the list goes on same with Angel Salona same with Jolene Westrad um, and Martha Heiss uh, one of the significant ones was, um, I, I, she just left a little while ago, but Faith Gordon-Meiser. 
when uh, I, I, I always looked at Faith like, whoa, she's way up there. She, she was one of those like OG youth martial artists that, that came up and did amazing things with the World Tongue Sudo Association. And uh, I, I don't know her whole story. You did an interview with her. Yeah, if you, if you haven't listened to that Faith interview, go and find that interview. It's on Meet the Masters. It's on my YouTube page. Um, go listen to that. It's she a took a break. Me. Is that how she fell yeah, behind? 12 years. 12 years. Yeah. So when she came back into it, she was number one. Like they, they, they put you by Don rank. So she was number one, and I was down in the 40s somewhere with, an, uh, with our numerical system. And um, so with number one, that's the person that has to make sure that everybody is present and accounted for, lined up in spots, and standing in a proper position uh, to do you know to do the things that you're going to do at master's clinic and you know not only did she lead by her legend and lead by her her just uh authority and status of being who she was she, you know master gordon's daughter but she was just um she, she she was a good leader she 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 accepted everybody uh there was an incident <laughs> which i won't get the whole story because we're going to over time but uh where we were short on the amount of people that could fit into a bus and I, and it came down to her and me and another one or two people. And I'm like, Faith, you got to go. Like, you're number one. You, can, I know that the captain usually goes down with the ship here, but I'll take the hit. You get on the bus. You make sure that you're lined up. And you know, it, 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 there was a respect there that I, I gained for her, which I already had respect for. But after that clinic, it was huge, and it was. It's never going to change. Like, I'm so, always going to look at her. She's big sister number one. Your 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 wife is. We're, we're kind of the same level, so siblings, sisters, and, and so I don't know. It, 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 that's all there is to say is that the bonds you forge are. I see these people, no joke, no exception. I see them more than I see my family outside of the ones that live directly with me. My mom comes around maybe once every two, three weeks, but I see these guys once a week. So it, it is your family, and I hope you guys feel that way too. And that awesome. is a positive note. Yeah, that is, it, yeah, it, that's, that's good. I think good. that's uh, a good place to end. So, uh, again, I know you're busy. Thank you for taking the time to uh, do this with me. Thank you for listening to me chatter. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate it, and I, I think it's some good. Um, and, again, you mentioned, Faith, if you haven't re listened to that interview, go listen to it. Um, go listen to all the interviews yeah. because, honestly, the, some amazing stories. Um, if you have some time. I, I just put them. I put them on when I'm in the car, mowing the grass, whenever it is, you know. So shameless plug. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> That's what these things started for. Right? Yeah, we, we were trying to interview those awesome yeah. people. So, uh, all right, thank you, sir. Absolutely, Tongsu. Have a great time, guys, for the rest of the week, and we'll see you next week. Um, my announcement for the next one will be coming out shortly. Tongsu.